TT first. Okay. Excellent. So in general, uh, strokes, it's always just do that sudden loss of circulation, giving you a, a corresponding loss of neurologic function. Strokes are ischemic most of the time. Uh, however, the same risk factors lead to both types. Uh, you're looking for a patient with hypertension, a patient with uh, hypercholesterolemia, uh, all of these, uh, you know, diabetes, all of these types of things. Uh, so here's our risk factors, family history, previous stroke, hypertension, dyslipidemia, AFib for those embolic strokes, uh, diabetes leads to vessel damage. And so you can definitely see it there. Uh, heart disease, carotid stenosis, cocaine use causes vasoconstriction and can lead to strokes. And smoking obviously causes a lot of damage to our vasculature and can lead to a stroke. So depending on the location of the ischemia, and this is what we're going to be talking about quite a bit today, depending on the location of the ischemia, the symptoms are going to be different. So with a middle cerebral artery stroke, you see aphasia. That should be a big part of the picture. If you're seeing that difficulty, producing words, uh, following commands, think about MCA, okay? Because that is, those two, Broca's and Wernicke's area, are firmly within that MCA territory, okay? Uh, these other... Th mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so... Yeah, so it can be global. So a global aphasia would involve... Um, the abilities to produce speech, the abilities to, you know, acalcula, acalcula um, you know, hemi neglect. When you have global aphasia, it's really affecting all, all of these upper processing problems. Okay. Um, so this neglect, oh, sorry, go ahead. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so so with uh, cocaine use should be more of a thrombotic versus embolic, absolutely, because you already have a very narrowed artery, you do cocaine, constricts the artery, and now you know you have no no blood going to that area. Absolutely, I agree. With smoking, um, yes, yeah, I I agree as well. Yes, yeah, so that would be more of a thrombus versus an embolus. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. That's an excellent point. Excellent point. Um, and so the other thing with cocaine use is there's a certain drug that you shouldn't give if you have a cocaine user um, that's typically used in patients with um, hypertension and um, cardiac failure. What drug is that? Beta blockers. Excellent. Okay. Yeah, good. No, you know it. You know it. Uh, and the, the single reason is because cocaine obviously works through this whole uh, norepinephrine adrenergic system. If you block off all of the beta receptors, it's the same thing as for pheochromocytoma. The reason that we block alpha before we block beta, because if you bl just block the beta, now you have all of these alpha receptors open that's going to cause this massive vasoconstriction. So now you have someone who has a stroke that's now having a, a myocardial event. Okay, and so beta blockers, you definitely have to hold on, hold off on for those um, cocaine users. Great. Uh, contralateral paresis, sensory loss in face and arm, uh, gaze preference towards the side of the lesion and um, homonymous hemianopia, uh, missing the same area of vision on the sa on both eyes, and so you would be missing, say, the right or the right side of vision on both eyes versus a um, different sides on each eye. Okay, great. Uh, so for anterior cerebral artery, we look for contralateral uh, sensory loss from the leg. Okay, and this is sort of what we were getting at earlier where um, the legs are going to be, or the lower extremities really, are going to be more effective with, it, with an anterior cerebral artery infarct versus the MCA infarct. You can have uh, parts of your lower extremities that are affected in the MCA infarct, as we did in the patient that we just looked at. Uh, but the reason is, uh, when we look at the motor homunculus, so here's our motor cortex. <clears throat> Hopefully, uh, this drawing makes sense. This is the central sulcus of our brain. And uh, the motor homunculus is organized where we have our face over here, we have our arms that kind of come up to the upper ridge, and then our legs hang off the edge of the ridge, right? Oh, you can't see it? Um, it's right at the top where it says strokes. It came up? Okay, good. Yeah. 
Uh, so the legs hang off the edge. Just imagine like you're hanging your legs off the edge of a, a pier, right? Into the water. And so the water here is going to be our anterior cerebral artery supplies this inner part of the motor homunculus. MCA is going to uh, provide blood supply to all of this lateral area. Okay. So lateral area, MCA, and then the inner area is going to be ACA. And so that primarily will be manifested in the lower extremities. For a posterior cerebral artery infarct here, we're looking really mostly at vision loss because that PCA is very important for the um, you know, occipital lobe, uh, visual processing system. So look for that homonymous hemianopia again. Uh, you can also see other um, strange things in vision. You can see uh, for your patient areas where they have like little blind spots or areas that um, they can't see just in their vision. Uh, if it's mostly a vision, the vision is the biggest part of the picture. You're going to think about some other things, but um, a PCA infarct should be uh, one of those things that comes up, especially if you start seeing memory deficits, uh, dyslexia, alexia, you know, um, not being able to read, uh, we, we would look for. Okay. Uh, basilar artery, the classic presentation of basilar artery. Um, uh, is this locked in syndrome, locked in syndrome. And so these, when you have a basal artery infarct, basal artery supplies a lot of the pons, medulla, uh, all of these areas that where you have, you know, um, information crossing over. And so you really lose basically everything. The only movement your patient's really going to be able to consciously do is a vertical gaze up and down. Otherwise they're completely locked in. Okay. And surprisingly, even though this is a pretty straightforward and obvious um, patient presentation, right? Locked in syndrome is pretty obvious when you see it. Um, I still get, got questions on basilar artery infarct on my step two, um, which I was surprised about. I thought it would be something really, you know, crazy and advanced and, and something I'm really going to have to like draw out and think about. But uh, one lesson I learned through studying for step one and step two is while, you know, you're, you're expected to learn a lot of these really kind of complicated presentations of strokes, most of the questions are going to be covering sort of the, the, um, the major ones, right? Rather than some, some of these more esoteric and, and bizarre things where you only have, oh, your right arm, you know, you can go up and down, your left arm goes right and left, right? You know, it's not, it's not anything really super complicated and advanced like that. It's going to be, a, know, know the meat and potatoes of strokes. Don't worry about these really rare advanced things because they tend not to be asked about, okay? Uh, lacunar strokes definitely qualifies as meat and potatoes. These are those strokes that you get in patients with hypertension. And so uh, the middle uh, cerebral artery, as it goes by the internal capsule, it gives off a bunch of little lenticular striate arteries is what they're called. Okay. And so what you have in this situation is a very um, high pressure artery. You, can you see what I'm drawing here under lacunar strokes? Yeah, yeah, the hairy thing. Uh, so, so the hairy thing is the middle cerebral artery, and these little hairs coming off are our lenticular striate arteries. And, um, and in all honesty, I'm kind of glad that you said it that way because um, what you have is a very high pressure artery, and then very small arteries that are direct branches of it. And so, when you have a patient with hypertension, those tiny little arteries are really going to fe be feeling the brunt of that increased systolic pressure. So what's going to end up happening is that you get these little um, lakes, essentially, and these are called Charcot-Bouchard aneurysms, and essentially they're just little areas of those small lenticular striate arteries that start to pouch out under all that pressure, and you know that's not really going to cause any any uh, issues for your patient. What's the problem is when suddenly one of these aneurysms bursts, and now you start bleeding into the area uh, right around here. Uh, and this is your lacunar stroke. And these patients present with a pure motor or pure sensory stroke. Okay. And so rather than, you know, with your MCA, you're having motor and sensory along with all these other things. If you see a patient that's just pure motor in one area or pure sensory in one area, think about a lacunar stroke. It's just a very small stroke in a very concentrated area causing um, one particular problem. Okay. Okay. 
All right, great. And so we're going to go talk in more detail about these things, but I kind of wanted to show you a diagram of uh, what I've been talking about so you don't have to sort of imagine it. Uh, here is our brain, the lateral view of our brain. You can see that uh, our middle cerebral artery, this is a picture from first aid, by the way, a beautiful picture from first aid. And you can see that the middle cerebral artery is really supplying a lot of the lateral side. So our Broca's area up here, or actually probably closer to the temporal or low. I would, I would put Broca's area right here. Our Wernicke's area over here would both be involved. And then as our motor homunculus is coming over, you can see that as it crosses into the MCA area, it would all be affected there. Our sensory cortex right behind the motor cortex would all be affected as well. Okay. If we split the brain in half and look at it from the interior side, what we see is that on the um, interior side, it's almost all anterior cerebral artery. So the anterior cerebral artery is going to be responsible for all of the uh, parts of the motor and sensory cortex that sort of droop over and touch the inside. That's really... Um, all you need to know in terms of this view of the brain and what's being affected, there's no important areas per se that we really need to focus in on. Um, for the temporal lobe, it's important to remember that um, in most directions, most way you slice it, uh, the middle and posterior share about 50-50 of the blood supply to the temporal lobe. Motor and cer posterior cerebral, I'm sorry, middle and posterior supply about 50-50 to the temporal lobe. Okay, and then so we can see uh, the inferior view of the brain here and uh, just sort of how that breakdown goes along. And you can also see why patients with things like an anterior cerebral artery stroke, you know, you're here, you're affecting, you know, parts of the visual cortex, or I'm sorry, the visual processing system as it crosses over. You have your mammillary bodies here that are being affected. All this area is, is uh, prime real estate and can be, can show up as uh, patient presentation. Okay. Last thing that we need to look at here is our motor homunculus. And so you can see, uh, again, like we mentioned before, how the feet kind of hang off and, um, and are sitting there in the water. The uh, knees, hips, as we go to the superior part of the motor cortex. And as we move our way around into the anterior cerebral artery territory, this is more of our hand, face, uh, all the way down into our tongue area as we move all the way out laterally. Okay, And I believe this is the sensory cor cortex, not the motor cortex, but the sensory cortex uh, and motor cortex follow the exact same sort of layout, okay? And so the last thing that I want to mention here before we move on is this idea of watershed zones. And so, you know, we're comfortable with watershed zones in the GI tract. Um, the most common place of ischemia when you have hypovolemia is where? What is the watershed area in the GI tract? Good, yes, yes. Splenic flexure. That's the area where the SMA and the IMA, they kind of share blood supply, but they don't, neither of them really give good blood supply. And so when you have some sort of um, uh, hypovolemic state, that's the area that's going to become ischemic. In the brain, we have the same thing. And so any, any territory where you sort of have two um, blood supplies joining together is going to be a watershed zone. Meaning when you have a patient that <clears throat> for whatever reason, um, develops a very low blood pressure, <clears throat> excuse me, those are the areas that are going to be affected. And so when you have some sort of global ischemia, what you want to look, what you want to look for is the man in a barrel um, presentation where patients can move their arms and legs, they can move their face, they, can have, they have sensation on arms and legs, they have sensation in the face. However, when it comes to moving their abdomen and their thorax, they have very limited sensation, they have very limited uh, motor ability. And so you can imagine sort of like if, you, if you're wearing a barrel, you can't really, you know, move your body left and right, right? You can't really, uh, or your abdomen, right? You can't sort of do one of these side crunches or a front crunch. You can't twist, right? Because you're wearing a barrel. And so when you have this man in a barrel where you lack sensation to your thorax, when you lack motor ability to all of your, um, you know, abdominal muscles, your rectus muscles, uh, external obliques, internal obliques, all of these muscles are affected when you have that global ischemia. Okay? Excellent. Great, so uh, in terms of diagnosis, first step is always gonna be CT without contrast. This way we can differentiate that ischemic from hemorrhagic stroke um, and identify potential candidates for throm thrombolytic therapy. Like we said before, if it is hemorrhagic, you definitely do not wanna give <coughs> throm uh, thrombolytics. <coughs> um, <coughs> 
it's mentioned in a lot of the review material. Excuse me, I don't know what is going on with my voice today. <clears throat> so, it's mentioned in a lot of the review materials that you can go ahead and do an MRI to really closely identify these infarcted areas. But this is not really something that is done uh, typically, uh, you know, in the acute state. Maybe down the line, as your patient is recovering, you can do that MRI to sort of figure out what the infarcted areas are. But MRI should never be one of the choices of what to do next in the ED. Okay. Uh, if you have a patient who is inpatient and is recovering from a stroke, okay, now now you can go get an MRI if neurology wants it, but uh, never in the acute um, <clears throat> in the acute state. Our Mm-hmm. Interesting. Interesting. Uh-huh. Oh, interesting. Okay. So uh, essentially just to repeat that back, um, if you have a patient whose symptoms have been less than 30 minutes, you may not be able to see the changes on CT. And so an MRI would be a better choice. Is that, is that it? Okay. Okay. In the ED. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. Okay. Um, that's, <clears throat> I didn't know that. That's, um, that is, that's an excellent point. And it seems like that's something that they can kind of go after you uh, with. So, so good. Good. Okay. I'll definitely have to add that in there. Um, good to know. Uh, in terms of treatment, uh, you know, uh, ventilation, if this patient is having issues with ventilation, making sure if we need to intubate, then, then go ahead, going ahead to do that. Check, check their ABCs, right? Whenever you get these questions, ABCs should be on your mind. Uh, fluid resuscitation, cerebral perfusion, um, to, you know, minimize ischemic injury to those damaged at risk areas. And, uh, then there's a the question of TPA. So when, once we have that clinical diagnosis of ischemic stroke, we can start to think about whether or not to give TPA. There's a lot of cases where you can give it. There's a lot of cases where you can't, and you got to know these, uh, contraindications. So first it is indicated for anyone with symptom onset less than three hours, like you told me earlier, and those with a measurable neurologic defect. Okay. Or deficit, excuse me. Uh, in those cases, you're good to go, but you got to check for the contraindications because they will slip these in there without you realizing it and uh, you can end up missing the question. So um, uncontrollable blood pressure. This one makes sense, right? If you give a thrombolytic and their blood pressure is insane, that ischemic is going to quickly turn into a hemorrhagic stroke. So that's that. this is probably the most obvious one. A recent history of stroke, myocardial infarction, head trauma in the past three months, okay? Three months, um, 90 days, if they've had any of these events, cannot give it. Major surgery within the past two weeks. And I know this seems short. However, most of the healing has been done by that point. So two weeks, you're good to go. Uh, any GI or GU bleeding in the past 21 days, three weeks, okay? So three months for stroke, MI, head trauma, two weeks for surgery, three weeks for GI, GU bleeding. If they've ever had a history of intracranial hemorrhage, any history of thrombocytopenia or active therapeutic anticoagulation, I'm talking warfarin um, or heparin, um, do not give TPA. Okay. Great. And um, so after we've sort of dealt with this question, uh, aspirin can, should be started in any patient within uh, one to two days after symptom onset and, uh, in order to break up any clots that are there. All right. Great. And so uh, I wanted to sort of get into now the different areas of stroke, but I realized that um, in order to really talk about contralateral, ipsilateral, and why things are the way they are, we need to talk about the spinal cord uh, tracts and talk about when things decussate, when things travel here and there. And okay, and so um, I'll admit that this is some more step one type stuff, so we can kind of quickly go through this part. Um, if you can help me along with it, um, so just in terms of identifying the different areas of the spinal cord, where would you put motor neurons? Yes, good. Anterior horn is going to be our motor neurons. <laughs> um, uh, sensory neurons then should be our uh, posterior horn. Very good. And this is where we have neurons synapsing on second order neurons for some of our tracks, not all of them. 
Okay, great. Um, the dorsal root ganglion is going to have the cell bodies for most of our sensory neurons. And, um, and then we have all of the white matter is going to be where we have tracks, where we have neurons traveling along and uh, making their way either down the spinal cord to the muscles or up the spinal cord from the uh, sensory organs. And so um, in terms of the tracks, we need to know where they are. So what uh, tract is in the back here? Got a tract in the back. Good, yes. Good, so our fasciculus, gracilis, fasciculus, cuneatus. Uh, gracilis is going to be the in inner part, and cuneatus is going to be the outer part. And if you think about the organization of our arms and our legs, gracilis being the part that supplies our legs, being in the middle kind of makes sense, right? Our legs are more interior, and our arms are kind of out to the side. So gracilis is always going to be the inside, cuneatus is the outside. Um, great. And then um, out here, we have our lateral tracts, which are going to be carrying, you know, uh, pain, itch, and temperature, uh, our spinal thalamic tract, essentially. And then we also have lateral tracts that uh, bring uh, motor information from the cortex down the spinal cord to its final place. Okay. Great. Um, some of the uh, Motor tracks are going to be inside over here. Some of the uh, lateral um, corticospinal tracts will be um, out to the front. But important, the most important thing is to know that your dorsal column is dorsal. And then your lateral tracts are out here in the white matter over here. Okay, And so that will kind of help us determine, depending on the disease, what our patient's going to look like. So for our dorsal column, uh, this is, again, some kind of step one um, chart uh just a quick review uh it's an ascending column this is carrying pressure vibration fine touch proprioception from the sensory nerves up to the uh sensory cortex uh so the important things here where's the first synapse so the first synapse here is going to be in the medulla right so that first order neuron it's going to have a cell body and the drg it's going to travel up the spinal cord and it's going to synapse in the medulla okay that's a pretty long that's a pretty long neuron, right? So that from the tip of your finger, it's going to go all the way up your arm to your spinal cord, all the way up the spinal cord, all the way to the medulla, right? That's a pretty long initial neuron. And that's the way that one works. The second order neuron is going to decussate at the medulla, okay? Decussates at the medulla and ascend contralaterally. Synapse in the VPL, um, all, all the sensory information is going to synapse in the VPL. And the third order neuron is going to be at the sensory cortex, great. Spinal thalamic tract, we have the ACE, these are ascending tracts again. Um, the lateral spinal thalamic tract is going to be pain and temperature. Anterior is going to be crude touch and pressure. But really think about your spinal thalamic tract as carrying pain, itch, and temperature. Okay, pain, itch, and temperature. I really want you to associate that. Um, and uh, this crude touch and pressure is sort of uh, less important because if you were to lose this crude touch and pressure, you would still have pressure and, and touch from your dorsal column. So it's kind of hard to differentiate lesions based on that. So that's why I say PIT, pain, itch, and temperature, spinal thalamic tract. Uh, first order neuron is going to enter the spinal cord. It's going to synapse in the spinal cord. First synapse is in the spinal cord. That's what the uh, posterior horn is for, for these synapses of your spinal thalamic tract. It's going to immediately decussate, immediately cross over. We have our, our here, uh, hold on, let me draw it down here. here we have our uh, little bit of spinal cord here. Um, so this is a cervical spinal cord. Just take my word on it. We have our pain, itch, and temperature sensation coming in. It is synapsing in the posterior horn and is going to immediately cross over at that level. And then it's going to enter that lateral um, tract and then start ascending to the thalamus. Okay. So decussation. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Uh. Exactly. Yes. This is the only thing that's contralateral when it comes to these spinal cord lesions. Yes. Um, yeah. That's why we have to review it because it's like, I don't know. It's a lot, a lot of different uh, <clears throat> things happening uh, for this sensory system. So that immediate de decussation means, like you said, it's going to be contralateral for anything. Anything upstream would be co a contralateral deficit. Okay, great. 
so a VPL is going to be where it synapses, all the sensory synapses in the VPL, and then uh, the final synapses at the sensory cortex. Last is our lateral corticospinal tract, which is our uh, voluntary movement of the contralateral limbs. So, so it's contralateral. So that means our uh, primary upper motor neuron is going to descend through the internal capsule. This is where we had those lenticular striate arteries coming in, and we have those Charcot Bouchard aneurysms, lacunar strokes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That's why we talk about it because this is where the motor neurons actually uh, descend from the motor cortex. Uh, these fibers are going to decussate at the caudal medulla and descend contralaterally. Okay. And so, uh, you know, having a lesion of the upper motor neuron above the medulla means it's going to be contralateral. If it's below, then it should be, uh, ipsilateral. Okay. Um, cell body of the anterior horn is where they will be synapsing, like you told me before. And then that lower motor neuron is going to leave the spinal cord and then synapse at the neuromuscular junction. There is no third order neuron for the, uh, uh motor system. Okay, great. So, uh, drawing it out. Um, uh, I, I don't think we really need to draw it out. I think it's pretty, pretty clear for you, right? Um, <clears throat> Just remembering that, you know, uh, what which of these are going to cross at the medulla. It's going to be your dorsal column and your motor. Uh, and those are obviously going in different directions. And the one that decussates at the spinal cord is your pain and temperature uh, for that lateral uh, spinal thalamic tract. Okay. Wonderful. So now we can kind of start to talk about some of these lesions at the spinal cord and then move into lesions at the brain and strokes and how they affect that. So... <laughs> Um, here, um, talk to me about, uh, this particular spinal cord, um, this spinal cord piece, um, just an FYI, these types of images will be on your, uh, step two. I had a couple of them. Um, and so you got to be comfortable with, you know, what you expect to see. So in this particular image, what tracks are being affected? Motor. Mm-hmm. Yes. Nope. Yep. Exactly. Very good. Yes. So spinal thalamic is a little bit more uh, a lateral up here. You can see um, for kind of giving you a preview, that would be your uh, spinal thalamic. This is going to be your um, descending tract as well as the, uh, the nerve cell bodies that are in the spinal cord themselves. And so since we're talking about motor, which is being affected here, our upper motor neuron or our motor, lower motor neuron? Lower, okay. What about upper? Is upper affected at all? Yes, good. So we have the lower motor neuron definitely is affected here because this is where their cell bodies are. However, because we are damaging the axons here in the descending tract, those are axons of our upper motor neurons. And so we have damage to lower, damage to upper at the same time. What condition do we think of with lower and upper motor neuron signs, but sensation intact? ALS, wonderful, good. So upper and lower motor neurons affected with sensation attacked. ALS, nailed it, very good. Um, next, we have a lesion here um, right at the middle of our spinal cord. So which tracks would be affected if we're just if we're just taking out that little middle piece? So this is going good. So this is going to be affecting anything that crosses over. If we have something crossing over at the central white commissure, um, those are what's going to be affected. So of all of our tracks, which ones cross over at the level of the spinal cord? So motor is going to cross at the medulla. Motor doesn't have to cross at the central white commissure. The ones that actually have to cross are going to be the pain itch and temperature that are coming in and synapsing here, right? Yeah, yeah, you know this. Yeah, so uh, they, they synapse here and then they cross and then they start to ascend, okay? And so this particular condition, when you have an, a widening of the, um, there's essentially a, a tube here, you can see it in this image, uh, that allows central, um, I'm sorry, um, uh, CSF fluid, 
to travel up and down the spinal cord and through this duct, essentially. And when you have a widening of that duct, it's called a stringomyelia. Okay. And so these patients are going to present with um, a lesion to their uh, pain itch and temperature from the contralateral side, right? Because this has to cross over. But what about information from this side? This information from the opposite extremity is being affected as well as it tries to cross over in ascent. And so we should see a bilateral loss of pain itch and temperature at the level of this lesion. Not below it, not above it, just at this level, because that's this is the only level that's being affected. Wherever these nerves are crossing, that's what's being affected. And so in stringomyelia, what we see is pain itch and temperature affected bilaterally. These stringomyelias tend to happen in the cervical region. And so really look for those upper extremities to be affected. Okay. Um, so, you know, any C7 uh, to T1, T2, T3, anywhere in there is where you tend to see this manifesting. And uh, the classic presentation is that your patient will be having, um, has been burning themselves on their fingers, you know, as they're touching things in the kitchen or um, as they're working in the shop, that they've noticed that they keep um, injuring themselves without realizing it. And so you want to check both hands and make sure that they're both affected. If they have this loss of pain and temperature on both hands bilaterally, you know that it has to be a stringomyelia because no other system is affected because no other system crosses there. And um, that's just how the typical pr patient presentation is. Yes, that is, yes, yes, that cape-like distribution because um, those dermatomes, they, have, they are here in our hand, but they, they begin at the level of, this, of um, our neck, essentially. And so that cape-like distribution for, say, like your, your, um, your uh, C, your C5, C6 is going to go all the way down the back of your arm. And so that would be the cape-like distribution because it's on both sides. Okay. Um, and so, uh, you know, when you actually go in and you try and test where they have a sensory loss, that's what you would see. Okay. Excellent. Next is our spinal cerebellar tract. Um, and so we can see, I meant to ask you about it first. <laughs> so, um, what tracks do we see affected in this particular case? Good, good, excellent. And so, you know, this is a patient that is going to have loss of, uh, you know, your um, proprioception, fine touch, um, you know, just whenever you have this um, dorsal column being affected in a very, um, in a very uh, singular way where it's just only affecting the dorsal column. Yes, there's a little bit of this lateral um, spinal thalamic, whatever, but you really see the, that dorsal column being affected. I really just think of the B12 deficiency and um, that tends to be what it is. So um, dorsal column is the biggest kind of part of your patient presentation, uh, giving you these paresthesias, impaired position and vibration sense. Uh, this is your subacute combined degeneration or vitamin B12 deficiency. Okay, good. And last, um, here we have some sort of lesion outside the spinal cord that leads to loss of this anterior portion of all of the uh, spinal cord. And so uh, we have really loss of everything except for our dorsal column. That means motor. Um, and uh, that means, you know, your lateral tracks. So everything you would expect to see there. And this is going to be due to a occlusion of that anterior spinal artery. You have an artery in the front of your spinal cord and an artery to the back. The artery in the back posterior tends not to be affected. But if you have a patient with a triple A, uh, abdominal aortic aneurysm and trying to repair that sometimes you can cause a um, cause damage or occlusion to this anterior spinal artery and uh, your patient's going to present with this upper motor neuron deficit below the lesion because as those upper motor neurons are trying to get down you can't they can't reach to their final target so in terms of upper motor neuron lesions versus lower motor neuron lesions, <clears throat> how are they different? What do you expect to see if I tell you a patient has an upper motor neuron lesion? Uh, what is that patient going to look like? Mm -hmm. Good. Good. 
Yeah, hyperreflexia, increased tone, spasticity. Um, those are the things you expect to see versus lower motor neuron would be the opposite. So, uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, atrophy, fasciculations, things of that nature, because the lower motor neuron is supposed to directly go to the muscle and it's not there. And so good, 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 good. Uh, so upper motor neuron uh, below the lesion because the upper motor neurons cannot reach their target. Lower motor neuron signs at the level of the lesion, at the level of the lesion, but not below. Okay. Because below the level of the lesion, the lower motor neurons are completely fine. That's why you're seeing this upper motor neuron deficit below the lesion, right? Um, and then loss of pain, itch, and temperature below the lesion because they're trying to travel up and they cannot. And so just, uh, you know, associate this anterior spinal artery with that triple A repair and um, you should be all set for the exam. Okay, questions on this? <laughs> yeah yeah it's starting to click right all of these tracks and um you know i feel like when we study for step one we learn everything in so much detail that once it's time to study for step two you kind of wipe away all the extra details and it's just like just the shit you need to know right um so good 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 okay so our hemi section um, this is one that comes up again and again. Somehow people are getting stabbed right through half of their spinal cord, and so we need to know about it. So when you have a hemisection uh, and you just lose half of your spinal cord, talk to me. Say the hemisection happens here at our T1 area. What do we expect to see above? What do we expect to see below the level of the lesion? Ipsilateral paralysis, okay. Good. Good, 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 good. So, contralateral loss of pain and temperature, and is that gonna be at this level or slightly above it? Um, hint, hint, it's slightly above it. And the reason why is because, yes, I told you that pain and temperature crosses right there at that level, but the truth is that's not totally truthful. It actually, it starts to cross at the level and then um, you got to see this stuff in 3D, right? And so, yes, it's crossing at the level, but it kind of crosses up like this and then goes into that lateral. Rather than directly crossing at that level, it starts crossing and then it continues to cross and go up. And so what you see is uh, it's going to be contralateral, um, but it's going to be slightly above the level of the lesion. Okay. It's, it's actually above um, because, um, like I said, you have the hemisection here and then what's going to be affected is slightly above because you have tracks that are crossing, um, you know, from below there, essentially, right? And so if you had a hemisection here, uh, some of these tracks are able to cross, but as you get closer to the level of the lesion, that's the area that's not going to be affected. Okay. Does that make sense? Uh, it, it's been, basically, you kind of have to like think about this like, yes, we're losing this this part of the lesion, but it takes a little while for that to manifest when it comes to pain and temperature because it takes some time for it to decussate. Okay. All right. So good. So ipsilateral motor, ipsilateral um, of your dorsal column, giving you, you know, loss of that fine touch, proprioception, contralateral uh, pain and temperature starting slightly above the level of the lesion. Okay. Wonderful. And so here is the, um, the diagram kind of showing that. And what we see here is that the level of the lesion is here and the loss of sensation, lower motor signs. Oh, you know what? You were right. I was wrong. I take it back. Um, obviously my understanding of this is, is way, way off. Um, so you were right at the level of the lesion slightly below that is your pain and temperature instead of slightly above it. I kind of had it backwards in my mind. I think I'm sorry about that. So, um, you were right. Whatever your understanding is, keep going with that because if the level of the lesion is here, the pain and temperature is going to be slightly below, uh, loss in sensation, lower motor neuron signs, um, for a few spinal cord segments and then upper motor neuron signs and loss of your dorsal column everywhere below that. Okay. Okay, great. 
Great. And then so we talked already about what we expect to see with upper and lower motor neuron signs. Upper motor neurons, um, you know, giving you that um, increased reflexes, increased tone, uh, increased, re um, you know, this class nice spasticity versus lower motor neurons is sort of the opposite. Okay. Great. So now getting into our uh, strokes. Now that we've talked about where things decussate, where things connect, we can talk about how strokes manifest in our patients. And so here's our circle of Willis. Uh, be able to um, to draw this for the most part. Uh, your and you know, especially this region. I'd like you to really be able to sort of draw this from memory uh, and label it, you know, on a chart. Uh, but you know, now that we're getting into step two, you should also have a pretty strong understanding of what the <clears throat> posterior part of the circle of Willis involves as well, with our superior cerebellar our IACA and our PICA. This one is super important because they can ask us about Wallenberg syndrome and our lateral medulla syndrome and uh, they want you to really know about this posterior inferior cerebellar artery. Okay. The basal artery is really going to be supplying all of the blood supply to, you know, the pons, medulla, like I told you before, the whole brainstem is the basal artery is very important for and you can imagine why when you have an infarct there, uh, you end up with your locked in syndrome. So, MCA strokes, uh, middle cerebral artery stenosis or thrombosis, let's look for motor and sensory cortexes in the upper limb and face. We have our temporal lobe with our Wernicke's area, our frontal lobe with our Broca's area, so look for aphasias there. Contralateral paralysis and hemisensory loss uh, in the face and upper limb. Uh, aphasia if it's in that left hemisphere, hemi neglect if it's in the right hemisphere. For our anterior cerebral artery, look for the lower limb and contralateral paralysis and sensory loss to the lower limb. Our lenticular striated arteries we talked about before, look for <clears throat> a, <clears throat> a uh, localized motor loss, localized sensory loss that is just affecting one part, right? Not, not the entire extremity, uh, maybe just the hand, not the entire <clears throat> right side, maybe just the upper arm. Look for just one, one localized thing without any neurologic signs uh, or cortical signs, excuse me. Uh, you know, the neglect, the hemiphagias, visual field losses, those are not going to be there because they're not part of the internal capsule. Okay. And so uh, next, our anterior spinal artery, we talked about uh, <clears throat> a contralateral paralysis of the upper and lower limbs, uh, decreased contralateral proprioception, Ipsilateral hypoglossal dysfunction. So the hypoglossal nerve is actually going to be supplied by our anterior spinal artery. And so we want to look for changes there. Uh, the anterior spinal artery is also going to be supplying the uh, medial medulla. So you can look for that medial medulla medullary syndrome. This one is not commonly asked about, um, not terribly high yield, but uh, this is one of those that uh, I suppose is, is potential, so it's good to know. So, uh, infarct of paramedian branches of the anterior spinal artery or the vertebral arteries, and you can see the uh, here's our anterior spinal artery, here's our vertebral artery. Those are all going to be supplying, uh, you know, sort of the hypoglossal nerve and <clears throat> and uh, and other parts of our spinal cord as it's emerging from the foramen magnum. Hello, hey. Okay, good. So, um, so I was just saying medial med medullary syndrome, not terribly high yield. Um, they're more likely to ask about your lateral medullary syndrome or uh, lateral pons syndrome uh, versus medial medullary syndrome, not asked about terribly commonly. With our PICA, our PICA, PICA is supplying our lateral medulla. So what is in our lateral medulla? Well, we have our vestibular nuclei. If we had an infarct, uh, to an area that contains our vestibular nuclei that is going to cause nystagmus, right? Uh, vomiting, vertigo, uh, this, this feeling of um, spinning, essentially, because we infarcted the vestibular nuclei. That makes sense. Lateral spinal thalamic tract. If, we, if that is there in the lateral medulla, expect to see a decreased, <clears throat> excuse me, um, a decreased motor from the contralateral side. Um, oh, excuse me, decreased pain inch and temperature from the contralateral side. The spinal trigeminal nucleus, this is going to be affecting the any sensation from the ipsilateral face. Ipsilateral face, okay? And so when you see changes where you have 
one side of the body is affected and then the opposite side of the body is affected when it comes to the face, um, this dichotomy should really point you to these different me medullary infarcts, okay? So here we have the lateral spinal thalamic tract. That's pain and temperature from the opposite side of the body. Spinal trigeminal nucleus. The um, cranial nerves do not decussate. Cranial nerves do not decussate. Think about your facial nerve. It leaves from the facial nucleus and it leaves the um, it leaves and goes directly to the muscles. It does not decussate. Trigeminal nerve does not decussate. And so when you have lesions in these nuclei, look for changes on the same side versus when you're destroying these tracks, you're looking for changes on the opposite side. So same side face, opposite side body. Start thinking about something going on in the medulla or the pons. Uh, for the pica, we are talking about lateral medulla. Nucleus ambiguous is involved. This is a very important one to commit to memory because nucleus ambiguous will not be involved when we talk about our uh, lateral pontine syndrome. Okay, Nucleus ambiguous is if we have some sort of um, infarct there, that's where we see dysphagia, hoarseness, decreased gag reflex. Okay, These nucleus ambiguous effects are specific to pica lesions. And so, you know, first thing, we're narrowing these down, right? So we see a patient that has uh, one side face affected, opposite side body. Okay, now we can think about medulla or pons, some brainstem infarct. So we're going to narrow it down to our pica or our ica. When we then see a um, dysphagia, hoarseness, decreased gag reflex, it has to be pica. Okay, so um, this is something that I want you to put a star by and really focus in on in terms of these different infarcts because it's really going to help you to get to your diagnosis. Okay? You could... Uh, you're always going to see the nucleus ambiguous effects? Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So this is the way that I want you to think about it is when you see one side face and opposite side body, you, you're already um, close to your diagnosis, right? Um, because you know that it has to be somewhere in the medulla, somewhere in the, uh, in the pons, right? So that really narrows you down. Now you're going to be looking for specific things for pica versus ica. So for pica, what we want to see is nucleus and bagos effects. For ica, what we want to see is facial nerve effects, okay? And so let's go on to our ICA. So for ICA, here we're affecting our lateral pons. So for here, our, we have some cranial nerve nuclei, so vestibular nuclei. That's going to give us our vomiting vertigo nystagmus. Doesn't help us too much differentiating between pica, right? So let's go on. Facial nucleus. Holy moly. This is our um, pot of gold here. Facial nucleus was not part of pica. Facial nucleus was not part of pica. So we can... Um, already really helps us to differentiate. And so we should see same side um, loss of motor to the face with a facial nerve nucleus infarct, okay? Spinal trigeminal, we already saw that in our pica. Uh, cochlear nuclei, again, giving us some of that um, uh, hearing loss. Uh, spinal thalamic tract, same as pica. So this is going to be same side face, opposite side body, just like with pica, but now we have facial involved as well, like we said before. Some sympathetic was there before as well. Cerebellar peduncles there as well. So this paralysis of the ipsilateral face uh, and contralateral body, that is really going to be huge. If they mention something like this decreased taste, don't forget that uh, the cranial nerve 7 has some sensory capabilities, right? Um, carrying taste from the anterior two-thirds of the tongue. Um, ipsilateral decreased pain and temperature from the face. Contralateral decreased pain and temperature from the body. Um, this is going to be the same as pica, but uh, this lateral pontine syndrome, look for those facial nucleus effects with these, um, these uh, you know, same side face, opposite side body, sensory deficits. Okay. There's this mnemonic. I think this is from first aid. Facial droop means Ica's pooped. Um, and uh, that's really going to be helpful for you to differentiate these come test time. Okay. Um, and this is sort of another one of those things where I really feel like, you know, when studying for step one, it was all a blur, it all looks the same, but now we're really kind of getting into the meat and potatoes. What makes these things different? How am I going to answer these questions? Well, I'm going to look for a facial droop. If I see facial droop and then all these other things, I already know my answer, right? Uh, you get more comfortable with reading through these question stems and, and, uh, picturing that patient in your mind to get to your diagnosis.
Last, our basal artery. This is supplying our pons, medulla, midbrain, corticospinal, cortical bulbar. Oh my goodness, it, it just supplies so many things. And so, while we do have that perceived consciousness, really all our patient has control over is vertical eye movement and blinking. Okay, so that's our locked in syndrome, which you will get questions about. Okay, and so this image um, I wanted to include for you. This was a, a um, CT that we obtained in a patient while I was doing my surgery rotation. And um, I'd like you to tell me sort of what you see here and um, uh, sort of just describe this CT scan for me. Good. 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 Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. Good. And so um, this patient, I believe it was a uh, a hemorrhage of you know maybe one of the uh, lenticular striate arteries, or um, it could have been middle cerebral. I I don't know the exact diagnosis of where the actual hemorrhage was, um, but you're absolutely right. So this is a right sided hemorrhagic stroke. Um, and then what do you make of this? So you can see that on on the right side, there's this sort of um, bulging area that's not that's not, not present on the left. Mm 